Wow. Patty Smith. How are things? Um, great. I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy that you're here. And uh, congratulations. I, I saw you won something, but I can't remember what you oh, won. But, right. <laughs> <laughs> but congratulations Thank anyway. You. You're very sweet to say that. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations on your show. Thank you. This is um, th this this. I went and saw it. I loved it. The, the your photos and these little artifacts that you've collected over the years, including the previous Pope Benedict slippers just hanging around. <laughs> um, how does one come across Pope slippers? Uh, well, actually, um, a monastery was closing down and they needed money to take care of the few old priests that were left there. And so they uh, sold their uh, second class relics. And one of the things they were selling was Pope Benedict the 15th slippers and he canonized Joan of Arc. And uh, he also worked very hard to try to stop World War I. And of course, he wasn't successful. Uh, but he canonized Joan of Arc. I have a strong Joan of Arc um, <laughs> uh, connection, so I, I bought them. And so I, I photographed them, and they're part of the exhibit. And uh, eventually, I'll probably you know, give them to a, you know, a, a, like a little Catholic museum or something. But right now, he's traveling. I, it's funny because at home, his slippers sit next to Robert Maplethorpe's slippers. And uh, there's some beautiful little they hang out. <laughs> <laughs> do they? Uh, do you think they share things? Um, well, often I find them askew in the morning, so I don't. Know, I, don't I, I, I don't know what they're up to, but the um, just the idea of being this close to things that were a part of your life that are gone. You've got these Polaroids, and a lot of them are deeply personal parts of your life. What was the impetus to take Polaroids? I, um, well, I've, I've taken photographs my whole life and sporadically took Polaroids to use for collages or th and things. But in uh, 94, I, having lost Robert, then my pianist, and then my husband and brother, and by the end of 94, I was tr truly devastated <laughs> as a human being. I had two small children. I was so uh, um, exhausted that I couldn't work. I couldn't write. I couldn't draw. There was nothing I, you know, I, all I could do was the most important thing, take care of my kids. But the, the impulse to create was very, still strong. And I just looked at my Polaroid camera and I took a shot with it. I took a picture of Noriev's slippers. I have a pair of his slippers. And I liked it. And I felt, you know, because the Polaroid is so immediate, uh, it gave me a sense that I did a nice piece of work. It gave me a, a, a sense of instant gratification without a lot of physical effort. So really taking photographs, uh, these Polaroids was a way of creating with a lot of, without a lot of physical effort, which I, I didn't have. And then I just got hooked. <laughs> what was that space like before you picked up the camera where you, I mean, it's in you to create, it's in you to share, but when you don't have it in you to actually do it, what was that like? It, well, it's painful, but I mean, no more painful than knowing my kids, you know, it's time to, you know, my daughter's uniform needed sewing and I didn't have the energy to sew it. I mean, anything's, when you have the, the, the desire or, or you have the responsibility to do things, it's difficult. But having a, a real creative urge as, as a worker, as an artist, it, it's, it's, uh, I don't, it's, it's like physically painful. So, um, but I found a solution and it was a happy solution and it led to uh, a whole body of work. So it, it did help me um, creatively work out a very, very difficult period. There's a real, like there's a lot of death that's a part of this exhibit and a lot of the stuff that you've done, but it doesn't feel like it's about death in a way. It's just you've got these, this collection of stuff connected to other people's death. Well, I think it's because so many people I love have died. I mean, I've lost in four years four of the most important men in my life and then after my father, my mother. I've lost so many people that I've loved. Um, 
and also so attached to great artists who uh, were dead before I was born, and then friends of mine like Allen Ginsberg or William Burroughs, so many people. And uh, I, I keep them close at hand. I don't think of all of these people. I know physically they aren't here, but they're a part of my daily life. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my kids and I talk so much about their dad that, you know, we've got to the point where we can actually joke about him or complain about him. You know, he, he doesn't have to be a saint. He's our king, but also, you know, he's part of our daily life. He's part of uh, the re routine of our life. It's not like he's... I don't save it just for his birthday right. or... I talk to my mom, you know, when I need uh, help or, you know, I feel like I need advice or the kind of uh, feedback or, or care that only a mother can give. You know, I consult my mother. I feel her. So I don't think of these as relics of the dead. They're, they're part of a life, the life of people that I cherish and still walk with. When you feel them, how do you feel them? How does your mother respond? Well, sometimes she scolds me or like <laughs> <laughs> But I, I you know, if I, you know, if I really feel demoralized or I, you know, if I'm if something as simple as if I have a concert and I have a migraine headache or I feel really tired, I feel like I can't do it. You know, I can hear her saying, "Come on, Trisha, Think about Judy Garland, you know? She used to feel a lot worse than you and she would just go on stage and give her all to the people. You know, because I know, you know, without an effort, I don't have to uh, fabricate it. It's just, I just hear her talking and, you know, it doesn't matter to me. Like if a scientist said, oh, it's just a projection of your mind or, right. it's, I don't care what it is. It's for me, it's communication, you know? And, uh, you know, I, Sometimes, you know, hear my friend Robert or Maplethorpe or, you know, my, you know, my brother. My brother is always with me, spurring me on. In the movie, this beautiful doc that you did, you talk about how the, the passing of your brother just made you a better person. Yes. I, yes, I said that because my brother was a better person than me, uh, is a better person. I lost my brother when he was 42. He had a bad heart and uh, I lost him a month after my husband and my brother uh, used to be the head of my crew uh, when um, in the 70s when I toured he was he's just so handsome he looked like Paul Newman he was uh, really cool uh, like HUD Paul Newman yeah HUD oh, like such HUD. a good the best Paul and Newman and he knew it too <laughs> I mean it's it just he was but he was so also so modest he was like Sir Lancelot you know he was uh, the great, greatest of knights and uh, and just a, a good heart very moral very uh, very loving and you know much more honest you know I just he was the better man and when he died a lot of his goodness his uh, openness his supportive you know a lot of his his things that were his I could feel within me and you know I also you know could feel him challenging me you know if I was going to take a shortcut or you know maybe not be so truthful here and there I could feel him and it Really, he resonates so much that I feel just a, a better person for carrying him around with me. Do you ever, I don't, I don't Although I, I'm not as good looking. As if <laughs> somehow the good looks didn't come up. But listen, <laughs> and it would be inappropriate for me to disagree with you, oh, but no, I disagree with you. No, please, please. You're, you're Patty Smith. You're my, you're my, you're my. You, when people ask me in interviews, who is your girlfriend? I say Patty Smith. Oh. So that's sort of how it goes. It's fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> I know as a... Well, listen, you're, I have to be truthful, right? Everybody at home knows it, so you might okay. as well know it. The, I know with, with kids it's different because you have a, a different responsibility and, and great relationships. When we talk about all that loss in a, in a period of time, do you feel alone? Um, no, I, I rarely feel alone. I'm not the kind of person that gets... Uh, I'm actually sort of a loner anyway, so it doesn't bother me to be by myself. That doesn't bother me uh, because I don't feel alone. I, all those people that 
I mentioned already, I always feel them with me, but I feel my kids with me. I never feel alone. I know my kids are with me all the time, and that's one thing we all say to each other. I love, in, in the Bible, my favorite line is uh, when Jesus, uh, at the end of Matthew, Jesus says uh, to his people, Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. And that, that what's more comforting than that? And that's the kind of uh, pact that I have with my kids, mm -hmm. you know? And um, so I always feel them. I, I, and they feel me. Do you have to believe in Jesus for that to be comforting? No, no, I just, he said it. It's a good line, you know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so you quoted him like we would quote George Carlin or somebody, right? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's not religion-based, you know. It's just, it's beautiful, you know, in terms of, you know, the greater faith, if, if, if people take it in terms of their own faith, um, that's beautiful. But just in terms of, you know, um, you know, it, it gives people a sense that they're not alone, that someone is, is out there. Walt Whitman said a similar thing. He wrote this poem and he said, uh, you young poet, you young poet, 300 years from now, I am with you. I am with you in your struggles. I am with you, you know, as you, as you write, as you feel that you can't write anymore, I am with you. And so Walt Whitman took a page out of Jesus' book mm -hmm. and, and sent a message to young poets, you know, 300 years down the line or more to know that Walt Whitman was thinking about them. I mean, it's, it's nice. The, so really, there would be spirituality in your plays. Pittman, I think initially that place in Pittman, New Jersey, had 12 roads to a center. Those 12 roads were all because of 12 of Jesus' disciples. I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, so you know the 12 roads that go into the auditorium yeah. there? Those 12 roads, there's 12 because it's Jesus' disciples. Wow, I, I didn't know that. I got to go back and count them. Go get this. Well, <laughs> now watch the city developers have screwed me and built a third road. Um, no, but it, no, there were 12. Yeah. Wow, well, um, that's nice. In your home, was there a lot of spirituality? Uh, my home was, I had a very interesting upbringing. Um, I was brought up Jehovah Witness. Uh, my father was agnostic. Um, and really, we were allowed to choose how we wanted to. Uh, conduct ourselves in terms of religion. My father was a very questioning man. We always had, you know, on weekends, I might walk in the house, there'd be a priest, a Catholic priest, somebody from Seventh-day Adventist. My father, they came to the door, he'd bring them in. That's like the opening and, of a joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so a priest and a Seventh-day Adventist walked into a house. And they found my father, you know. <laughs> but my father was very knowledgeable. He read the Bible several times. He liked to discuss it. He liked to spar. He liked to play dev devil's advocate. And, uh, you know, when I was brought up Jehovah Witness, I, I left early when I was a young teenager, but I had a very strong um, scriptural education. So... But it wasn't really important in my household, mm -hmm. religion. What was important was more uh, being a good person, you know, having values. You know, my father didn't care about your religion or anything about you as long as you were a good person. So... Did some of the questioning and the sparring um, fuel you when you go to New York and you're young and you're walking into a world that are mostly guys? That is the presentation anyway. And there you are coming up. Did that help you? Well, you know, I never really had felt uh, uh, intimidated or um, concerned about my gender in terms of doing my work. I truthfully never thought about it. I've always was sort of a tomboy, a Peter Pan kind of kid. I never really thought that, uh, you know, I mean, I would admire if, you know, a lot of great artists that I admire were male, but I didn't really feel that being a female uh, put me in a different class. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that, you know, I just did my work. For me, it's all work-based. You know, if, if, you know, if I feel that I can, you know, match somebody, you know, no matter who they are, I'll step up and try it. And if I feel that someone can teach me something, they know, they know better, um, I'm a happy student. You know, I, I don't really... For me, my goal is just, I just want to do good work. Mm -hmm. I never cared whether I got rich or famous or any of that stuff, but I did daydream, you know, about 
um, creating masterpieces. I'm more presumptuous than, you know, <laughs> wanting simple fame and fortune. I wanted to make masterpieces, that's all. <laughs> well, listen, you want to talk about masterpieces, just, just, just as a performance, this is where my mind was first blown watching Patti Smith. Let's go back to Saturday Night Live, watch this. Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. I've watched that clip as many times as it's possible. I would be the reason that Lauren Michaels would pull that off of YouTube. That's how many times I've watched it. What's in your mind when you're doing that? What do you What do you think when you're singing that? Uh, now? You mean now then. or? Well, back then, you know, I, it was, uh, I, it, for me, it was a very, um, the statement of that song was really a declaration of existence. It was not against Jesus Christ, you know. People always say to me, oh, they used to say, you don't believe in Jesus. And I said, what are you talking about? It's the first thing I invoke on my first record mm -hmm. is his name. What I was saying back then was, I'm taking responsibility for my own actions, taking responsibility for my own transgressions, uh, because I wanted to, I wanted to explore. I wasn't ready, you know, to uh, not make mistakes. I wasn't ready, you know, just to, um, you know, walk a straight line. And I wasn't going to bother Jesus with all my, with all my stuff, with all my problems, and uh, and ha he'd have to, you know. He'd have to die a thousand times, you know, to take care of uh, what I was up to. So, uh, so it was really, it was really just, it was, uh, you know, de like I said, declaring my existence, and I was, it was joyful, you know. I was excited to, uh, it w I remember that well. I can remember it just like that, you know, because Saturday Night Live had just begun. I think that was their third or fourth uh, show. I was excited to be on TV, you know, and uh, I knew all my, my friends and my people were watching, and it was, uh, it was exciting. Do you, do, when you're in a moment where your contemporaries, your friends, are all ultimately considered heroes by successive generations, do you know that's happening when it's happening? Uh, Sometimes, not always. I mean, sometimes people say to me, oh, you know, you, you know, I read your book and it's like you act like you only ha hung out with famous people. Well, they weren't famous back then. I mean, they were struggling or even, even Allen Ginsberg was struggling. I mean, he was beloved, but struggling. And, uh, you know, I hung out with Sam Shepard. He, he was making his way and Jim Carroll was a starving poet. These people, you know, they were my friends, you know, and Robert, of course, struggling. And uh, at, that, at that time, we just wanted to eat, you know. My main concern when I was young, I don't care if there was, I was sitting in a room with uh, Janis Joplin or, you know, any of these people that I met was how I was going to get my next meal. You know, and often I'd be in a room with a lot of famous people or at a party or something, and what was I doing? I had a paper da bag and I was putting food in it for later. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my concerns were different. Does the, does the literal and the metaphorical hunger drive one's art? And I, <laughs> and I wonder then when you don't have that, what Oh, no, I, I always have drive. I mean, I, now I have plenty of money to buy food, you know. I don't need, uh, you know, I mean, there it's were a lot of times... the bag for you in the green room <laughs> side. Just some stuff. You know? I, I, I don't... Uh, I just have a, the... I've had it my whole life, is uh, the enthusiasm to create, the desire to create. Uh, I prefer not being physically hungry because I can work better if I have food, you know? So it's not... I'm not, I'm not a person that uh, needs to suffer to do my work. Mm. I just, I'm a worker. If you could go back and say something to this girl, <laughs> look at this. My, uh, um... Picture that. <laughs> well, oh. my hair, I have to say, I have very long, straight hair, but they insisted that, and they put these, uh, things, like they were all pinned up, these curl things, because mm. my hair is just the same as it is now, only it was black then. But, yeah, that's me. 
It was nice girl. It's a nice girl. Natasha, that was your name? Your they nickname? used to call me Natasha because I used to have very long, straight black hair, like on Bullwinkle. All right. That makes yeah. sense. Oh, like you were a spy. There's a lot of activities you're into, Bulletin Board Committee being one of them. Football Program Committee. What were you doing there? <laughs> I drew the cover. <laughs> That's what you did? Yeah. There are many things that we Well, would... I was, uh, you know, also, you know, I, I spurred my uh, team on, you know. I was very, uh, I was very enthusiastic in school. I love school. Do you think people would ever have considered you a class clown? Because uh, in the class clowns, you're one of them. Yep, I was, uh, well, I, I was funny. <laughs> I was, There's no... When I was younger, one of the things that I really <laughs> wanted to do, I never wanted out of a rock and roll band. I never thought of having a rock and roll band. But I used to daydream about taking over Johnny Carson's stint. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have like a show like that, you know, and like talk and like tell stories and joke around and, you well, know. That's what, here's, here's you and, and another talk show host, watch this. I have great respect from the people in, from which I, I learn moves from, you know, from, I think of myself a lot of times as an illuminated apprentice and these people are my masters and I study from them. I've been studying Johnny Carson for several years. In fact, I had to study Johnny Carson for 12 years in order to get on your show. Tom, come on. <laughs> Move it. No, 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 this is moving fine. Go on. If you're on a talk show, sit in the talk oh, show. No, no, sit no, in you're talk so show. good. No, no, no. No, I like you so much. <laughs> Believe me, it's a tribute to you that I don't want to take over your gig. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, you can, you can have it. You, it would be all right. Uh, what do you learn from studying people like Carson? Well, the best thing I learned from Johnny Carson was uh, uh, an ability to improvise and to spar. Because when I started performing, uh, I was not well loved. I mean, people were like, comb your hair or, you know, get back in the kitchen or whatever well, they would say. album covers with, with, with armpit hair, which yeah. was amazing, but at the time, people freaked yeah, out. Yeah, people freaked out, but even before I recorded, before I, before I, like in 1971, 72, when I was performing, like in bars, for, doing poetry and stuff by myself, I got a lot of people yelling at me, mostly to get off the stage. <laughs> and uh, so I always pulled from Johnny because he's like a human parachute. You know, he can bail out of any situation. And I always, you know, was able to one-line them, you know, to shut these guys up, mostly truthfully guys. But, um, you know, by the end of the night, I would have people on my side because I had a lot of good one-liners. And I learned that from, from Johnny, not to be intimidated, not to fall apart or, you know, feel like uh, a lesser being, but, you know, to pull out something, one-up them, mm -hmm. pull out. You know, they think they're so cool, step back and lay something on them and be cooler, so. Speaking of cool, we'll get into that with some more video. More with Patti Smith right after this. Tell us who you are. Melissa. Okay, Melissa, ask. Um, what, made it, what made you decide to take a music career? Well, it wasn't so much a music career. It was to enter in the field of rock and roll because when I entered it in like 74, I really thought most rock and roll stunk. And I thought if somebody uh, didn't get in there and start working, it was going to become a big business instead of uh, a powerful force for us kids, <laughs> myself included. All right, all right. Bob and Patty Smith. Selling it to the kids. By the way, th that's a great scene, but here's what happened later on in that show. People here would like to hear Patty Smith sing. We asked Patty earlier if she would sing a song, and she said yes, she would sing a ballad. What will you sing for us? Well, I want to see, sing uh, You Light Up My Life, and I know that's a weird ch choice for me, but I like that song because I think that uh, if you really get into the words, it's, it's got a really great message, especially for 1979, Year of the Child. Mm -hmm. A reflective person as it relates to your own life? Reflective? Yeah. I don't, uh, only when I'm writing. I mean, I try not to be too reflective because I can fall on a lot of painful holes. And, uh, you know, because no matter how well I negotiate loss and things like that, um, I still really miss my husband very deeply. 
you know, no one's ever replaced him. I miss my brother. I miss, you know, Robert. And, uh, you know, and certain things I've done in my life. I wish I was a better daughter. You know, I wish I'd have spent more time with my mom. And, you know, there's a lot of things that I could feel sad about or feel pain about. So I try not to spend a lot of time in those areas. I know they exist. And uh, so my reflectiveness is really, I save for writing because then it, it, it's, uh, it translates into something useful or it translates into something that I can share with people, not just private suffering. Well, you know, when people go see this, this, um, this show at the art gallery, uh, the AGO, there's a real tenderness to a lot of it um, and a real intimacy to it, but it doesn't feel like it's a betrayal. When do you feel closest to somebody like Fred, your husband, when do you feel closest to Sonic? I, usually it has something to, well, sometimes it's just unexpected. Like sometimes I'm just walking down the street and I'll just like hear him say my name or I just feel him. And it's always fleeting and it, I'll just, it's such a nice thing. Uh, but for a, t for a, a s sustainable thing, it's always through my kids. Yeah because they magnify him. When you play with your kids, that's oh, yeah. unbelievable. I mean, we're playing together, you know, it's just like, when I play with Jack and Jesse, I mean, the three of us all feel it. We all, we all magnify their dad, so. The, um, did you have a, a trigger in your life where you realized you weren't going to take the straight path? Was there something that happened where you went, here's where I'm going? I think, uh, well, as a little girl, I love books. I wanted to learn to read right away. And I was reading before I went to school. And so eventually I wanted to write. But the real, the real strong trigger was when, uh, when I was 12, I went to a museum for the first time and saw art. I saw Picassos and, and I got a real sense, because writing I was still relating as books. And then I saw that art existed. And after that, that's all I wanted to do. It's all I wanted to be was an artist. And, uh, and that alone in the 50s would set you apart from other kids. And, um, but also just appearance wise, I was never that interested in my appearance except for a specific way. I liked to wear the same clothes every day. I didn't care about girl stuff. Um, so I was always a little, uh, you know, I wasn't like marginalized by people but I was a little maverick early mm -hmm. on. But that's why I think I developed, uh, you know, when it says, you know, I won class clown, developed a kind of humor to compensate for being different than everybody, being skinnier, be, being taller, being, you know, interested in, in things most of the kids in my school or people in the 50s weren't so interested in. You think that's why you were, when they were kind of trying to invent whatever they thought, the outside thought punk rock was, why you were put in that category? Well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, my band absolutely anticipated punk rock, but so did the Stooges, so did the MC5, so did Mozart, so did Arthur Rimbaud. I think the idea of, of that, it's always, you know, this intense maverick freedom. And, uh, you know, I really think that you know, in some ways, my band anticipated it and the actual punk rock kids af came afterwards. But except, you know, there's an aspect of me which is right with them. I'm right with the grunge kids. I'm right with the, because I have that kind of energy that doesn't come from technology or technique or, you know, it's just a raw, um, uh, just a raw creative impulse. And That's what Iggy's saying about his raw power. Yeah, it comes out when I'm, pl I'm playing electric guitar. I mean, when, when we do concerts, I don't feel in certain parts of the, my concerts any different than I did 30 years ago. I have the same agitated energy. I can access that same person that used to kick, put her foot through monitors. Mm -hmm. uh, I have that same thing. It's just that I've also evolved in other areas, so it's now a part of a whole and doesn't dominate my performance. The, uh, I was watching footage of you going after George Bush, hardcore, like hardcore. To, it, like it was an epic assault <laughs> on stage. Do you feel betrayed by the administration? 
Well, I felt betrayed when they went, but you know, we I feel be, could be a be, feel betrayed by any administration. But when we went into Iraq, I thought it was one of the worst things I saw in my lifetime, because you know, having protested and being against Vietnam and finally finding closure there, I didn't think that we would do anything more like that. You know, I thought we would elevate ourselves to a more righteous place. And there is nothing righteous about going into Iraq, as we found. I mean, we know that, you know, South Korea has uh, weapons of mass destruction. They just did three nuclear tests. We're not there, you know. So, I mean, we went into Iraq and destroyed their infrastructure and a lot of their their, their, their mosques, their libraries, their water supply, and thousands of people. And yeah, I feel betrayed. Do you think your country's changed? I think the world has changed. You know, I, I can't just say oh, my country's changed. I think we have changed since, since September 11th, uh, sadly. I think that we have lost some of our gumption, some of our youth. I think we've forgotten who we are, you know, and in, in the, you know, and everything comes under this homeland security, the Patriot, our Patriot Act. I think if we would have reacted different to September 11th, and saw that as an opportunity to globally communicate and have some kind of global forum and talk this out. But, you know, we went in and acted like, you know, you know, illiterate cowboys and just, uh, you know, and, and, and sh shifted, you know, and created an enemy. But there was a time, certainly with the Vietnam War, where you had, and, and you saw it again in the war in Iraq, there was this mass of people who opposed and you found artists and people with a platform who kind of became the vocalizers of it. Do you believe that there are people today like you were when you were in your early 20s, like Dylan was, like Ginsburg? Do you think that the generation today making records and poetry, they're there with that anger? I think that, uh, well, you know, only they can answer that, but uh, I think that we, uh, present generations have not found their core unifying principle that they're all together on. You know, they, we, you know, I was against the Bush administration going into Iraq, but I can't say many of my peers were. People were f afraid, people were reticent to uh, not support him. And, uh, and I, I don't, I think right now our culture has changed so much because of technology, and I think that they're still trying to negotiate our new world, which is very, it's celebrity-based, it's youth culture-based, it's uh, technology-based, and they've got to figure all this out, but they need to unify on one principle. It should be the environment. I mean, the environment, we should globally be united uh, about right now and start making changes, but th that that should be the thing and we'll see but you know I I think it's wrong to talk down any generation each new generation has to figure out You know they got to negotiate stuff that I didn't have to negotiate mm -hmm. You know I have no idea what it tastes like to be in my 20s in our present culture you know and uh, so they've got to figure out you know what they're going to do on this new landscape. It's a new frontier. What a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Happy Smith, everybody. Here's the exhibit. It's called Camera Solo. It runs through May 19th at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And she's got this record. Banga and the book. We've got all her tour dates on Strava.com. We'll be right back. You know, give them to a, you know, a, a, like a little Catholic museum or something. But right now he's traveling. I, it, it's funny because at home his slippers sit next to Robert Maplethorpe's slippers, and uh, there's some beautiful little. They hang out. <laughs> <laughs> do they? Uh, do you think they share things? Um, well, often I find them askew in the morning, so I don't. I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't know what they're up to, but <laughs> the. Um, just the idea of being this close to things that were part of your life that are gone. You've got these Polaroids, and a lot of them are deeply personal parts of your life. What was the impetus 
to take Polaroids? I, um, well, I've, I've taken photos. Smith. How are things? Um, great. I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy that you're here. And uh, congratulations. I, I saw you won something, but I can't remember what you oh, won. But. <laughs> But congratulations, Thank anyway. You. You're very sweet to say that. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations on your show. Thank you. This is um, this this. I went and saw it. I loved it. The, the your photos and these little artifacts that you've collected over the years, including the previous Pope Benedict slippers, just hanging. Photographs my whole life, and sporadically took Polaroids to use for collages or th and things. But in '94, uh, I, having lost Robert, then my pianist and then my husband and brother. And by the end of 94, I was tr truly devastated <laughs> as a human being. I had two small children. I was so uh, um, exhausted that I couldn't work. I couldn't write. I couldn't draw. There was nothing I, you know, I, all I could do was the most important thing, take care of my kids. But the the impulse to create was very still strong and I just looked at my Polaroid camera and I took a shot with it I took a picture of Noriev's slippers I have a pair of his slippers and I liked it and I felt you know because the Polaroid is so immediate uh, it gave me a sense that I did a nice piece of work it gave me a, a, a sense of instant gratification without a lot of physical effort so really taking photographs, uh, these Polaroids was a way of creating with a lot of, without a lot of physical effort, which I, I didn't have. And then I just got hooked. <laughs> what was that space like before you picked up the camera where you, I mean, it's in you to create, it's in you to share, but when you don't have it in you to actually around. <laughs> um, how does one come across Pope's slippers? Uh, well, actually, um, a monastery was closing down and they needed money to take care of the few old priests that were left there and so they uh, sold their uh, second-class relics and one of the things they were selling was Pope Benedict the 15th slippers and he canonized Joan of Arc and uh, he also worked very hard to try to stop World War One and of course he wasn't successful uh, but he canonized Joan of Arc. I have a strong Joan of Arc um, <laughs> uh, connection, so I, I bought them. And so I, I photographed them, and they're part of the exhibit. And uh, eventually I'll probably...